and welcome to Representative Warren Camp's Legislative Report. I'm Laurie Bull. Representative Camp is here today to update you on some of the major issues that have occupied the time of the legislature in recent weeks, most notably Marcellus Shale impact fee legislation and the state budget. Welcome. Hi, Laurie. As I've said, uh, one of the largest issues in play really for the last several years was a lot of talk about uh, Marcellus Shale and the drilling in those regions um, and imposing an impact fee. Uh, we finally gotten to that point. But first, before we talk about the legislation, can you define to viewers what an impact fee really is? Well, I, I think the general concept is when the drillers are pulling permits and then drilling in particular counties, they're causing impacts. Uh, they're obviously having an impact on the land. They could have an impact on the roadways. Um, they take up municipal services, county services, uh, fire department, hospital services. They have an impact on housing. And so the concept of an impact fee, generally speaking, is to try to make them fund the impacts that they're causing to the local communities where they're going in and drawing out the gas. So after much negotiation and debate, there was finally a, a bill that went through both the House and Senate and went to the governor and it was signed. Uh, how is the, the fee imposed or who imposes the fee? And then once that money's collected, where does it go? Well, uh, it is a decision of the local counties where the uh, drilling is taking place. Um, and if they decide to impose the fee, then it is collected by the Public Utility Commission, the statewide commission that oversees utilities. Um, if the counties themselves don't want to do it, however, the local municipalities where the drilling is taking place can band together and force the counties to uh, take the fee. And then once the, the fee is um, uh, sent to the Public Utility Commission, then it is divvied up according to a formula that maybe we can talk about a little bit. Um, I, think, uh, I think one thing to recognize is it, it is an impact fee. Mm -hmm. um, there are statewide and also local impacts that are being caused by this um, drilling boom. Uh, and this fee, this structure in the legislation you talked about, is really designed to try to address some of those impacts. So uh, as you talked about, there are some statewide impacts as well, and the fee is set up in, in a way that the, the local areas will get a portion and a portion will come back to the state. Can you talk about that and what the state uh, programs are that are benefited from this? Sure. Um, I think they're projecting in the first four or five years um, that somewhere between around 150 million to as much as 400 million would come into the Public Utility Commission through this fee. The way the fee is set up uh, is like this. The first year of a, of a, a drill site, $50,000 would be paid by the drilling company um, as essentially the impact fee. The next year it would be 40000 the year after that 30,000 and so on down to I believe 10,000 and then it's 10,000 for several years out to a total of 15 years. Okay. Now the fee can go up uh, if the price of gas goes up. Right now the price of gas is about two dollars a cubic foot so um, the numbers that I just used are the ones that uh, would apply. However if it went up say to six dollars then the first year's fee uh, could be as high as say fifty or sixty thousand dollars and then it would scale down from there. Also, uh, if in the next couple of years drilling activity were to go up, uh, the Public Utility Commission could increase the fee. I believe it's kind of at the rate of inflation. Okay. So although it is a flat fee, a fee structure, um, there is some room depending on the price of gas and then the increase in prices generally or inflation um, that it could go up. All right, now how is it broken down? There is kind of an off the top amount that really goes to administration. The Public Utility Commission is gonna have to spend resources in order to administer this. Um, I think the statewide fire commissioner will receive about $750,000 because there are 
implications to our emergency services community because of um, you know using uh, technology to drill for natural gas. Um, I think there's also some resources that goes to the Department of Environmental Protection, to the uh, Fish and Boat Commission, uh, and I think that's you know mainly to deal with the administration of the drilling boom in the um, in the places where this is taking place. Um, after the off the top occurs, then 60% of the fee will go to the local communities. And it's pretty well spelled out in the law what the local communities can spend it on. Of course, uh, roads and bridges, local fire companies. Um, I think there is something in there for tax relief, for planning and zoning that may be necessary, fees associated with that. Um, but there's a sort of a list of 14 or 15 things that they can spend the resources on. And mainly those are focused on the impacts that are caused by the drilling in those communities. Then 40, the remaining 40% is for statewide initiatives, something that most of our communities are familiar with down in southeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, things like growing greener, um, hazardous sites cleanup. And this is money that can be used for uh, some open space initiatives, trails. There is a piece for infrastructure, roads and bridges of a statewide nature and it'll go to the counties based on their population size. Um, so there, there are statewide impacts to this. At the state level, it's not entirely about impacts from the drilling community. It's also about the environment generally and growing greener and programs like that. Um, and I, I think you would find, particularly in the way the fee distribution is structured, it is a piece of compromise legislation. I mean, I read the other day that it was back in 2003 when the company that first did hydraulic fracking in Pennsylvania did their first well. So we're talking about almost 10 years, and yet here we are in 2012, and this legislation was just passed. I've only been here for about a year and a couple of months, uh, but it obviously took some time. Uh, maybe some time was wasted in the past, but um, this fee structure, I think, is, as a piece of the overall legislation, um, a compromise measure that in the end is, is doing good for the citizens of Pennsylvania. Uh, one of the concerns was maintaining some local control in this. Uh, what are your thoughts on how, how the law uh, did maintain some local control? Well, I think in, in a couple of ways. First of all, as I described with the fee, sure. Uh, sixty percent of those resources are going to be spent by the counties and the municipalities. So those counties and municipalities, as long as they're following what the fourteen some categories are for the spending, um, can control how they use those resources to deal with the impacts of the drilling in their communities. The other piece is zoning. Um, and there were uh, questions about whether there should be kind of statewide preemption of these rules, um, that there should be sort of a, a state set of rules for the drillers and the local communities should not be involved. But in the end, I believe that local control is preserved. They can continue to zone as they would like, so long as they don't single out drilling as something that's different from other industrial uses. If they zone and plan as they would for any manufacturing activity, any industrial activity, uh, then I think they're going to find that they have plenty of control over drilling in their communities. Certainly environmental issues are uh, of much concern to your constituents and I'm sure you had those on your mind as you considered whether or not to uh, vote for this bill. What does this bill do in regards to environmental regulations and, and safety measures both on the preventative side and on the side that if the unfortunate did happen, uh, standards there as well? Well, I actually find it uh, instructive that um, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation uh, the Growing Greener Coalition, um, I think it's the National Lands Trust. These are very um, uh, reputable organizations that uh, their number one goal is to protect the environment. And these entities, these nonprofits, these protectors of our environment have said that they support this legislation. So that in and of itself is, I think, pretty good proof that this is good environmental legislation. 
Uh, it's probably one of uh, only a few such natural gas uh, pieces of legislation in the whole country that actually puts what normally are regulatory or regulation rules actually into the law. Um, there are setback requirements from water courses, from sources of public water. Um, there are water treatment and water management requirements. There are resources that will be devoted to um, uh, the protection of storm water. Uh, and, and they're replete throughout this legislation, reporting requirements on chemicals that are used in the fracturing process. Um, I, there's a, a list that we could probably talk about for several hours, maybe a couple of days. Uh, and it's right there in the law and it's going to strengthen our ability to protect our future uh, from things that may occur. There was a concern that maybe if an impact fee is implemented that it might drive drillers out of state, but then on the other side there were folks that were saying because there's all this uncertainty and we're going back and forth about whether to have one or not, that in itself is driving business uh, drillers out of the state because they don't know what's coming. Um, any thoughts on how this plays out now that there is an impact fee? I mean, do we, do we see uh, you know, any evidence that they may go elsewhere? Well, I think natural gas is a very complicated matter. There is um, a lot of natural gas recently discovered throughout the United States and then also uh, around the globe. Um, and the larger gas companies have been going after that where they can find it. Um, they're, generally speaking, larger companies, pretty sophisticated. And if you do impose a uh, kind of a job-killing tax on them, uh, there's enough natural gas out there that they could go elsewhere. Um, however, Pennsylvania has a healthy supply of natural gas in this Marcellus formation. Some are saying almost 50 years worth of, uh, of natural gas. Uh, and I'm skeptical that the, the companies would indeed just leave town because, uh, because you put this particular fee or that particular tax on it. I think the fee was a compromise. Um, I would have supported a, a, a tax or a fee, uh, but uh, we know that Governor Corbett said he only was going to do an impact fee. Some people in the legislature didn't want any fee whatsoever, um, but I think they ultimately came around because this was a compromise. It has statewide elements to it, statewide beneficiaries for the money, but it also has uh, local uh, value to those people where the, the drilling is occurring. Uh, so, you know, I think in the end uh, what we've done here is made it so that the good things that are coming out of the Marcellus boom, the, the gas boom, will continue. Uh, but uh, we've also made it so that the drilling companies are paying for the impacts that they're causing to our communities. Um, and at some level, we're getting some of the benefits of the resources that are Pennsylvania's resources. This natural gas, after all, is ours. It is the landowners. It's the people where, um, uh, where this drilling is taking place, where they live. Uh, and we want them to see some of the benefits of, of this boom. And certainly, just to clarify, there's nothing to say that if there's unintended consequences from the, from the law or some gaps that are found down the line that, that the legislature can't go back and revisit it. I think that's right. I mean, I, I think we've done a fair amount of study looking into this. Um, the Department of Environmental Protection has been on top of this. Um, a number of people in the legislature have been focused on it. So I think we have a good product here. But um, uh, absolutely, if changes need to be made, then we should make them. Well, this is a good place to take a break. And when we come back, we'll talk a little bit about Governor Corbett's budget address and his plan for spending in the next fiscal year. Legislative Report will return in just a moment. Did you know that Fort Indian Town Gap, located in Lebanon County, is home to Pennsylvania's only Veterans Memorial? C.J. Frederick of Westchester, Bucks County, submitted the winning design that now honors those men and women who have sacrificed their lives in defending this great country. Dedicated to the Commonwealth on October 7, 2001, the Veterans Memorial is surrounded by freestanding walls and houses an amphitheater 
which can accommodate large crowds during an event. Strategically placed in the front of the amphitheater is a tomb that reminds visitors of those who gave their lives protecting the freedoms of this nation. The design suggests a war-damaged structure in which Frederick wanted to impress upon those visiting the horrific arena of war. Now you know. Did you know that in the corridors in the first floor of the capital of Pennsylvania, there are nearly 400 individual mosaics? The idea for creating these intricate tiles was first suggested by Henry C. Mercer in 1902. A year later, he received the commission to prove 16,000 square feet of pavement tiles for the great rotunda and corridors of the new state capitol building in Harrisburg. Mercer set about designing subjects for approximately 400 mosaics. He chose as his general theme the history of Pennsylvania, and he soon realized that his tiles could tell stories. Although the arrangement seems random, the mosaics are very thoughtfully placed in the floor. The tile sequence is roughly chronological, beginning at one end with the scenes depicting the Native Americans. The mosaics progress into the story of European habitation in the New World and encompass the Commonwealth's triumph through process and intervention. Now you know. Welcome back to the program. We've been discussing the Marcellus Shale impact fee legislation and uh, just to turn to that a minute before we head to the budget, uh, there was additional monies in that that are supposed to be directed to, uh, I guess, incentivizing a market for all of this natural gas that, that is being uh, extracted. Can you talk about that? Yeah, it, it comes out of something called the Marcellus Works Package. Mm -hmm. And the basic idea is um, there's a lot of natural gas. Um, we are dependent on foreign oil. Um, is there a way to try to move our transportation infrastructure towards natural gas? And so in the first couple of years of this impact fee um, being imposed, there are, um, I think, about $20 million set aside for grants to either transit agencies or even private fleets to try to convert some of their vehicles or some of their activity to natural gas, um, especially in, I think, our, our urban and suburban areas. Uh, that's a good thing. It's a good thing for all of us, maybe a little bit less expensive than foreign uh, gasoline. Uh, and, you know, I'm in favor of that. And it shows, I think, that Pennsylvania is trying to move in that direction uh, as a state and not just in fits and starts. Well, it sounds like a, a great way to, to make use of the resources we have right here. Uh, let's change topics. We want to hit the state budget. And uh, Governor Corbett came before the state Senate and state House and, and gave his proposal in an address, as is the habit every, every year. Uh, what were the basic points of his plan that he laid out? The basic points were uh, flat spending. So about $27 billion was the operating budget last year that we all voted on. Um, and that's what he's proposing this year. Mm -hmm. um, no tax increase uh, again. Uh, and that's fundamentally it. Now, if you go down a layer, um, he is proposing to essentially level fund uh, basic education K through 12 in the districts that I represent, the Tredyffrin East Town School District, uh, the Phoenixville School District, the Methacton School District, and the Norristown School District. Uh, that is basically flat funding, although there, there are some differences for Norristown because it benefited from something called the Accountability Block Grant, uh, which uh, is not in this year's governor's proposal. Um, he also tries to create a general block grant for our school district, so for transportation and for the basic ed subsidy, kind of give them a lump sum of dollars uh, and then kind of eliminate some of the red tape that would have gone with that if it was just in four or five different pockets as it was last year. Just a little more flexibility for them. Yeah, and we'll, we'll see how that worked works. Um, I'm still waiting for some reaction from the school districts on that. Mm -hmm. um, but that is essentially the proposal. I, I do think people should know that there is a pretty significant uh, reduction proposed by the governor for higher education for our state-related universities and our state-owns. Um, 
you know, I, that's actually come up in the appropriations hearing since his budget address. We have to have a budget by the end of June, and I'm sure there's going to be lots of talk about those topics. Uh, what are you hearing from analysts or, or folks that are testifying uh, to the Appropriations Committee as to how the economy is doing? Are we heading up? Is there a recovery? Are we flat? Are we not recovering and, and heading in the opposite direction? I mean, I, I think the kind of the national papers uh, have been reporting that things are getting a little bit better. Um, there is some growth in the last couple of quarters, and that's a good sign. Um, in Pennsylvania, our unemployment rate is a little bit above uh, 7%, which is better than the national average by, I think, a full percentage point. So that's also a good sign. Um, one problem is, and, and I think it's probably pretty obvious, um, you know, the question is, can you, wh what do you do? You can't spend more than you have. Um, the governor had a budget last year that we all, uh, in the end, signed off on after some negotiation and changes that was about $27 billion. We're running a bit of a, a deficit right now, more than halfway through the year. I think we're $500 million less than um, projected in revenue collections and tax collections. Um, and that suggests that the economy, at least in the first half, wasn't doing as well as projected. We still have a few more months. Last year, the latter months of the fiscal year were pretty good, um, and so we're, we're hopeful. Uh, I recall last year, at the end of the year, we ended with five, six, seven hundred million dollars uh, in what some were calling a surplus. However, we had very significant uh, debt right. um, that we don't have to go into right now, but the decision was made not to program that money into last or into this year's budget. I'm sorry, into last year's budget, um, and it turns out that was a pretty wise move, because since we're under collections this year, um, we need to make up that difference. On top of that, um, we just to operate the government uh, with pension increases. Our pension costs are going up on the school side, just for the state. $300 million this year. We're almost at a billion dollars that is um, proposed to spend on pensions for our school district workers. That's state contributions. Remember, the school districts pay 50% of that, so it's a billion from them and a billion from us, which is a total of $2 billion just for the annual pension contribution for our school district employees. So that went up $300 million. Our state worker pension contributions are going up a hundred million. Healthcare costs for any entity, including the government, seem to always go up at five, six, ten percent. Our debt service costs have gone up, even though we haven't um, uh, increased borrowing. So uh, this is going to be a challenging year, and I think the governor's budget, at least in its kind of you know big picture, is recognizing. We have two choices. We can either spend what we think we have, um, this $27 billion number, um, or uh, you know, some might propose increasing taxes or borrowing more, but that's not what the governor is proposing, and I think he's right to avoid that. Um, you know, our economy in the state is not going gangbusters. It's not going gangbusters around the country, and if we take more money from people, uh, from companies. There's a real risk that we're going to set ourselves back and next year we're going to be in even worse uh, a situation. Uh, as, as we move on through the process, there's uh, what's called appropriations hearings. Can you describe that process for people at home, uh, what happens in those hearings and how that helps move the process forward? Well, uh, you know, I think everybody uh, should know the governor makes his proposal in February and then for about a month, month and a half, the department heads from his administration and from the independent agencies come into the two houses, to the House and the Senate, to their appropriations committees, um, and they present their budgets and their requests, and they are questioned by uh, the members on those committees. Um, and then after that, uh, the essentially the leadership of those committees comes back to the members 
and begins to take uh, kind of a sense of uh, what people thought about that present, those presentations, what they think of the governor's budget overall, and then going forward, probably into May and I would say June, that's when you really begin to see proposals on the House floor uh, about a, a particular budget bill, and, and we'll get it done by June 30th. Um, at least I would sure like to, because that's what the law says. Well, certainly uh, Corbett's, Governor Corbett's plan is just a starting point, and it's his vision uh, to start with. Um, are there areas that, that you would like to see go a little different, or are there priorities that you have that may be a little different? Well, I, I think there are a couple of things to point out. As I said, the higher education uh, proposal from the governor is certainly somebody something that's getting some comment uh, among the media and then also, you know, in my district. Um, last year, I think the higher education, that is, you know, uh, Temple, Penn State, Pitt, those are the state related, there are four of them. The reduction ended up being about 20% off of their subsidy um, from the year before. The governor had proposed a 50% reduction, but I think the legislature generally thought that that was too steep. Um, the governor has again proposed a 30% reduction uh, for both those state-related, uh, Pitt, Temple, Penn State, but also for the state-owned, like Westchester, um, and there are 14 of them around the state. Um, and, I, and I think there is concern about that at what point, particularly with the state owns that rely a lot more on state dollars to operate, what that's going to mean in tuition hikes or um, other impacts. Uh, I will say this, however, you know, uh, unless you're willing to raise taxes, um, is those savings have to be found somewhere. And it's going to be a, I'm sure, a very serious negotiation to figure that out. One thing I've focused on is the Department of Public Welfare, which is very large, $28 billion a year if you include the federal money. It's actually bigger than the state government by almost two-thirds. Um, now, some of that money uh, certainly goes to um, individuals with intellectual disabilities. Um, you know, there are uh, enormous costs that go along with caring uh, for people in that situation. Um, and, and yet the department is being strained, I think, probably all across the board. However, this is the same department where uh, the old attitude was close your eyes and authorize um, in food stamps or in, in uh, welfare or Medicaid. Um, and I think the governor's administration is doing a pretty good job of trying to root that out um, and operate with less. Uh, a lot of those things are rules from the federal government, entitlements, um, and, uh, and we're going to need some help from, from Washington in order to make that department right-sized. Uh, I just mention that because it's a very big department. Uh, certainly there are savings there, but there are also people who are needy, who are receiving uh, the benefits from, from the state and the federal government because they absolutely need them. Um, they can't care for themselves. And we, we just have to focus on that and, and make sure everything turns out as best it can. Well, that's going to have to be our, our last thought for the day as time has run out very quickly. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Lori. Sure. If you have comments or questions about this or any other legislative topic, Representative Camp's contact information will be shown in just a moment. Thanks for watching and join us next time for Legislative Report.